What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Nick Cantmine, social media at Bitcoin Magazine, co-host of Bitcoin Kindergarten Q&A with Savage Bitcoin of My Living Truth, and writer and author of several great articles. And uh, I think you call yourself the Bitcoin Zoomer. Uh, I think these these articles that we're going to dig into and, and what you're doing is great f- information for you know young people to hear. Um, but I'm really interested in you know a conversation across generations, as well as um, I think this information and this articles that we're going to get into um, you know apply to anybody of any age. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing over at Bitcoin Magazine and what Bitcoin Magazine is up to? Sure. So at Bitcoin Magazine, my role is I'm the social media guy. So I run their Twitter. I run their Facebook, their LinkedIn. I also run the Twitter accounts for Bitcoin Black Friday and our Bitcoin conference handle. So I do all of that. And as well as so CK Snarks, he really he's the main person who runs our um, YouTube channel, but also I have access to that and I make YouTube videos and I uh, do other content and stuff for them and help them out wherever I can. So that's my main focus at Bitcoin Magazine. That's what I was hired for. Sure. But I really enjoy writing and I try and write as much as I can over there i haven't published too many pieces just because i've been so busy with other stuff but i actually just finished a piece it was a pretty long one it's uh going through the editorial process now it's like 10 pages long but i'm hoping to get that out hopefully next week and that one i'm really proud of and i just dot i dove really deep and i talked a ton of shit about the current financial system and i was pretty much the goal of that article is to explain to people that the current financial system cannot work if the majority of the people know how it works you know if the majority of people know that their money is worthless and it's printed from nothing they would drop it immediately so i'm i'm happy for that piece to go out eventually yeah that sounds awesome you mentioned uh, an editing process and from what I gathered from some of your earlier writing, it, that was kind of off the cuff. Uh, it seemed unedited, and that, that seemed kind of style, kind of your style. Um, is there is there more of a process now with your writing? So the articles I've posted on Medium and Dig, those were all unedited. It was just by me. I would type it up and just post it out. So I would always get some shit in the comments like, oh, you have a spelling error here. You have a you know, grammar error there. So I'd, I'd go back in and fix it. But um, at Bitcoin Magazine, there is like a mandatory editorial process where once I finish it, I send it off to our editors. They go through it, read the whole thing and edit it out and make it all nice and clean and touch it up before it's posted. And um, yeah, it's it's not that difficult of a process, but if you look at my writing style from my Medium articles compared to, let's say I did an article for Bitcoin Magazine where I covered the news of uh, MicroStrategy buying their first amount of Bitcoin. Mm. That article is, it's super clean. It's super touched up. Like you would notice a big change in a style. So, yeah, it's my my work for Bitcoin magazine is a lot more like, quote unquote, professional looking. <laughs> right. H- how did you end up working for Bitcoin magazine? This is actually a really funny story. So I my first two years of college before I dropped out, I worked at a physical therapy clinic. And because of covid, I ended up getting laid off in I'm sure you know Al, um, who hosts Dirtbag Friday. Mm-hmm. And I was in Dirtbag Friday every Friday, hanging out with the plebs, talking, having a good time. <laughs> and I remember in January when I got offered, the very same day I got offered to intern for Marty Bent, I got an offer to intern uh, for Brady at Swan Bitcoin. And 
I was talking to the plebs and I was like, you know, I'm out of work right now. I'm like having withdrawals from not stacking sats. I need money coming in. So should I just hit up Brady and get an internship at Swan again? And Katie Anana, Anina, she was like, oh, well, let's just meme you into a job. So everyone gets on Twitter and starts tweeting out that I'm the CEO of Swan. <laughs> the Swan boys jump in the chat because they're like, our company slacks blowing up saying Nick's the new CEO. And like, it was just this big joke. But um, yeah, I was applying, like I applied at Trezor. I didn't get the job and I was like looking around, but that night in that Owl's Dirtback Friday, CK Snarks was in there and he messaged me, like you can type message on Zoom. And he was like, bro, I heard you're looking for a job. I may have a gig, like let me know in a few weeks if you're interested. Uh, a few weeks passed by, I hit him up and he's like, yo, let's hump, let's hop on a call. I think you're perfect for this job. I haven't even written up the job description for it yet, but I think you're perfect for it. So we get in a call and he was like, bro, I love the stuff you're doing on Twitter. I think you can definitely do this job. How would you like to be the uh, social media guy for Bitcoin magazine? And I did not think it was going to be that. I thought it was going to be some like random job, like, you know, edit some articles or like, you know, do some bitch work for us or something. But um, (laughs) like... So the process went really quick. A week later, I had an interview with the CEO and CTO of Bitcoin Magazine. A week after that, I got a call from them telling me that I got the job. Mm, That's awesome. Well, Mm -hmm. let's go back a little bit further. Um, What what brought you to Bitcoin? Uh, What were you up to? It was my senior year of high school. I had never even heard the word Bitcoin. I knew nothing about it, nothing about the space. Like I hadn't heard the word blockchain or crypto before. It was all so new to me. And I was, I had got home from school and I had soccer practice in a few hours. Like I played for a really competitive uh, travel team and it was my senior year. I didn't feel like doing my homework. So I was just playing video games until practice. And my brother and his friends come downstairs in the basement and they're talking about Satoshi Nakamoto and Bitcoin. And he's like, Oh, like I knew I should have invested so much earlier, blah, blah, blah. Like Bitcoin's at 6k now. And I'm looking at them thinking, you know, what the hell is Bitcoin? So they try explaining it to me and I'm looking at them like, you guys are idiots. This is a total scam. And I I just turn around. I forget about it for a couple minutes. They keep nagging me on. And I, I worked a ton of jobs in high school. Like every summer I had a job. Uh, Even if I didn't have like an official job, I would be raking leaves. I would be shoveling snow. I'd be mowing grass. Like I really wanted as much money as I could, you know, just to I was high time preference. I bought a lot of dumb shit, but you know, I just wanted money to, you know, have fun. Yeah. And, what, um, what were you buying? A what? lot of it was probably food and video game stuff. Me and my friends, like before we got a car, we would always skateboard up to the local uh, shops, shopping center, and we would just buy like tropical smoothie all the time. We'd go to the GameStop and buy like Xbox stuff, and just, <laughs> just you know, stuff like that. Sure. And um, so. I was super gullible at the time, and when they're telling me I can make a ton of money off of it, I was like, okay, well, even if this is a scam, I'm trying to make some money off of it as well. So <laughs> I I download Coinbase, and I buy like 50 bucks worth just right off the bat, and I don't know what it was, but I was instantly hooked. I've been looking at Bitcoin stuff every single day since that day, and it just fascinated me the more and more I learned about it. And I'm really happy I didn't get scared out of the market when the peak of 2017 dropped and all of 2018, it dropped from 20K to 3K. And it just, there was something about it. Like I knew I was hooked just instantly. Yeah. What What, what were people, what did people in your real life, especially before maybe the job with, um, or the internships and things like that, how are they reacting to your, your Bitcoin journey? Uh, you know, you're putting real money on the line. You, you know, you, you're working hard for that money. They, you know, you're, you, maybe they want you to save it for your future. 
uh, how, how are they, how's your family taking it? How are your friends? Do they just make fun of you? So my brother gives me a ton of shit all the time. He, he constantly tells me that he, he doesn't see how Bitcoin can ever reach 20 K again. And you know, like these people, they think that, and I asked them why, and they said, well, everyone in the world already bought it because it already got super popular. So it'll never get 20 K again. So they think like that. They give me shit. It's whatever. But my parents were very skeptical at first. Um, like my dad would constantly ask me like, you know, oh, how much have you lost in Bitcoin today? <laughs> like, right, right. I, like none. But one of the things is, is I never have told my friends or family how much like money I've actually put in. Like, obviously, I'm not going to tell them the exact dollar amount or Bitcoin amount I have. But like on Twitter, I'll tweet. I've tweeted constantly. I'm all in on Bitcoin. Like not like pretty much 99% of my net worth is in Bitcoin. Right. And I'm happy and proud to say that. But like, if I would have tell, if I would tell my parents that they would get pissed, Sure. you know? And, but, um, to be honest, my friends, I normally don't talk about Bitcoin with them. I kind of like to see them as like an escape for a little bit so I can just be a, degenerate with them and you know do just normal 20 year old stuff but um that's mainly because a lot of them they they like it they're not against it but that my friends and my squad i hang i hung out with didn't really care for right. it so like it was kind of hard to bring it up in conversation but i noticed like the more people i met like let's say at school and just like through work and stuff if you bring up bitcoin they've they're definitely open to the idea they're definitely open to it i just think one of the things that holds them back is the risk part of it because they've heard oh is this illegal is it dangerous is it you know i heard it's really volatile and you can lose your money you know one of the things i really hate and i've heard this constantly is Oh well, if I put my money into Bitcoin, it could be gone the next day. Like that's it's it's just so wrong on so many levels. Yeah. So I mean, whether you talk to them about it or not, or, or how much you share with them, I mean, you, you're obviously leading by example. Uh, I, I think about the article you wrote, uh, Bitcoin, you know, versus you know, Bitcoin opportunity versus the university opportunity. I'm sure I'm not quoting that t- title right. Um, but what what went into that article? Uh, what led you to write that article? And and what does it mean to you? Or what are you trying to con- what what's the message you're trying to convey to to maybe people that are thinking about college and whether they should go and and what kind of college they should go to if at all? Mm-hmm. So college, like I never had an actual reason to go to college. I remember my senior year, I always felt obligated. I had to go to college just because everyone else was doing it. You know, all my friends are going to college, you know, to party and you know, get an education i feel like most people just tell them that like it's just a lie they keep telling themselves because i know a ton of kids who go to college and they don't do shit for their education right and um i didn't know what i wanted to study there was nothing i really was that interested in and so many it's so expensive and my brother is about a year and a half two years older than me and he was kind of the same way. He went to a uh, popular university near where I live and it was expensive. And he eventually ended up not dropping out, but just transferring to the community college because it was cheaper. And I kind of learned from him and he was like, dude, like, I don't know what I'm doing at college and I don't want to be paying, you know, 15 to 30 K per semester. Like that's ridiculous. And I really kind of, I, I remember like hearing about the gains you can make in Bitcoin. And at this point in my life, you know, my senior year, I was a shit coiner. So I was like, you know, and I was so like in like, oh, my gosh, I could do a thousand X off this coin in a week. I could do this. I could do that. I could get rich. And but one of the things that I learned is I could probably make more money just working a job and stacking Bitcoin then, you know, over the next four years than I would working a job. And my thought process was over the next four years, 
Bitcoin's going to be a lot more expensive. It's going to be a lot more scarcer. It's going to be harder to accumulate as time goes on. So I went to community college and I got a job working at a local physical therapy clinic because that's the only thing I was like remotely interested in. And as I kept dying, I, I uh, kept diving down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It became more and more clear to me that Bitcoin had a better opportunity cost. And I have a friend group of Zoomers, of nine other Zoomers, which of I'm one of only two Americans in that Zoomer uh, group chat. Like everyone else is from the rest of the world. And just hearing everyone's Ba- different backgrounds and how they learn and like different schooling systems and stuff and also i get dms constantly from people telling me yo nick you should probably think of dropping out of school like you know just work your ass off accumulate bitcoin you can always go to school in the future but you can't always accumulate 3k bitcoin you can't mm-hmm. always accumulate 6k bitcoin And I would have these conversations for hours with people. And after a while, it just kind of wanted me to like, because it was just all I was thinking at one point. And I was like, you know what? I'm thinking about dropping out of college. I feel like I have a lot of, you know, stuff to say. So I just wrote it out on paper, tweeted it out. And uh, I know like Saifedi Namus always talks about it. Like, um, colleges today are just socialists and communists and indoctrination camps and you know you can have different views on that but like i was kind of like seeing that in my own school like just teaching like stupid stuff like gender studies and like socialist classes like socialist economics and stuff and it's just like why i don't want to pay for this Right. You know, if I'm going to spend my youth and my money out of school, I don't want to pay for this. I want to learn good stuff. And I was getting the education of a lifetime fucking around on Twitter. And, you know, when I was in school, I feel like I feel like college was getting in the way of my education. So that's why I wrote that article. I just felt like I had a better opportunity cost putting my time and effort and money into Bitcoin. Let's say Bitcoin didn't exist, because I, I think you're spot on with with the opportunity cost of college. Um, I, I think it's changed dramatically over the years. I mean, for myself, it was a much different bet. College was a lot less money back, like 20 years ago. Uh, most, uh, I think, the living expenses of living in room and board were more expensive than the tuition expenses. Um, and I enjoyed my college experience, but I would never. I can't see. You know, knowing what I know now, you know, spending 18, you know, years 18 to 22 partying, learning a little bit, learning about a lot of things that might not apply to your future career. Um, You know, I can't see wasting those times. I would, like you were saying, create value, go out there and and get experiences, network. Um, So, but let's say Bitcoin didn't exist. Do you think you'd have the conviction to, to drop out of college without Bitcoin? You know, I don't know. I know I got accepted into this university in my state and it's a university that all my friends are going to. It's kind of a decently big party school and I wanted to go there initially and I had my mind set completely on that. And I don't know what else would would drive me to have that conviction to drop out of school because it's not like I don't have like a business idea or anything. I, that's a very good question. I'm not sure how I would have handled a uh, life without Bitcoin or what path I would have chosen. I feel like I would have got it eventually because, you know, with all the stuff going on in the world, I like to dig deep and try and find the right answers. Like I know, uh, like the normal mass media, like they lie about a ton of stuff and, or they don't give you the facts straight. So I feel like I would have found out, you know, like money printing and stuff eventually, but it would have probably taken me longer. Sure. I want to jump into, you know, the, another article you wrote, uh, 10 things I learned as a Bitcoin zoomer. Um, let's just kind of run through this list. And if you could kind of explain what you mean by, you know, nobody owes you anything and, and not so much, uh, you know, for yourself, but like 
what you're trying to get across to to another Zoomer, but, but mm-hmm. nobody owes you anything. So, other than my uh, Nick Can't Mind Twitter account, I have what I call a normie Twitter account, and I don't want to say the at or anything. I keep that super, you know, anonymous. Sure. And all I do is I follow soccer stuff. Like I love looking at European soccer stuff. Um, I keep up to date with like memes and stuff there. But one of the things I see is I see a lot of normie stuff and I see this with my normie friends in real life that I went to high school with is they feel so damn entitled to everything. Like, and I feel like that's how just most of my uh, generation feels. Like I remember seeing a tweet with over 300,000 retweets and it was some girl bitching that she couldn't afford an apartment and how the government needs to step in and make like, it was such a stupid argument. And she was saying that she deserves an apartment because she's a full-time college student, but she, and she doesn't have time to work a job, but she's pissed off because she wants her own apartment all to herself. And she doesn't deserve that. You know, Mm -hmm. no one owes her anything. You're not born on this earth with anyone owing you anything. You know, it's like when you're born on earth, like I feel like people forget, like you just got to survive and eat at the end of the day. Like everything else is just extra. And if you want, you know, the good stuff in life, you're going to have to work hard for it. So that's what I mean by nobody owes you anything. Like if you really want to work hard, you got to educate yourself you got to work hard but more importantly you have to work smart and i put in a quote from some movie i saw when i was a kid and i remembered it like throughout my whole life but it says i see now that the circumstances of one's birth are irrelevant it's what you do with the gift of life that determines who you are and i just think anyone from any background in the united states can make a name for themselves, can be successful, can do whatever they want to do. And I just think a lot of kids bitch and complain about it when they don't get it their way. Right. Uh, then the next one, you have to do what's best for yourself. Yeah. So when I was deciding on college and what I want to do for work, etc., I would always have people in my real life tell me what I should do. And I'm always open to advice, but like, I feel like people tell me, I feel like people tell me I should do what they would have done if they were in my position, but not like necessarily what's best for me. Cause like a lot of these people who are telling me what I should be doing, I feel like didn't know me personally or didn't know me well enough to, uh, like actually give me sound advice. So I feel like the only person who knew what I wanted in life was me. And I I took some advice from my parents and my brother and uh, my, my close friends. But at the end of the day, like I just didn't want to go down like the normal path. I wanted to do what I thought was best for me. Like I remember reading all these quotes of like, if you want to be successful, you got to, you know, not do what everyone else does. You got to, if you want to stand out, you got to be outstanding, like stuff like that. And that really like motivated me to kind of do what I think was best for me and stray away from the crowd and, you know, go down this route. And um, some of the people on Bitcoin Twitter have given me some of the best life advice I've ever gotten. I remember when I worked at the physical therapy clinic, sometimes it would be a slow night and I would whip out my phone and I would DM like American HODL and I'd be like, bro, I know you're successful as hell. You're rich as hell. I'm, you know, I'm some broke college student. Can you tell me how you got to be so successful? And we would just sit down and talk and he'd give me some really good advice. And yeah. Yeah. He definitely has a lot of great advice in his feed uh, and the pods he's been on. So the next two go together. So uh, don't believe everything you read. Dig deeper. I think that's obvious. Um, read more, the better. So what is Nick reading? What are you reading, Nick? What What are you reading today? Where do you think people should turn for information? So before I get into that, I just want to say, like, I was having a conversation last night with Jackie. He's another Bitcoin Zoomer. 
And we were talking about the don't believe everything you read, dig deeper. And one of the things that separates us Bitcoiners from like your quote unquote normal people is that we understand don't trust verify and everyone's a scammer. Like when you read stuff online, you got to understand that pretty much everyone is trying to work an angle or, you know, push some some sort of narrative, especially in mainstream news and Twitter with fake accounts and bots and et cetera. So don't believe every headline you read. You always got to dig deeper and see the other side of things before you make like an actual judgment. What I'm reading right now, I – the current book I'm reading right now is the rational male, just trying to like learn how to be a more alpha dude and just like be better with chicks and stuff. (laughs) But, um, I've been reading some Bitcoin books. I read the Bitcoin standard. I, I went through the Bitcoin standard twice. The second time I wrote down notes and I highlighted all the key important stuff. And I've been handing that book out to my neighbors and they've been loving it. I actually got a few people uh, to buy Bitcoin back home. So I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, I have Inventing Bitcoin, the little book of Bitcoin. One thing I'm really excited that I got was the Citadel 21 magazines. Super dope. I can't wait for the fourth edition, mainly because my my article's in it. But uh, right. yeah, I, th- I, that's yeah, I read your article there. That's where this article is posted, 10 Things I Learned as a Bitcoin Zoomer. And I think it's, you know, go check it out. What's the deal with Citadel 21? I'm not familiar myself. Um... So Citadel 21, it's run by Hodlnot and uh, Cadia. So I'm not sure the exact reason why they wanted to start it. I think it was just a fun project that they wanted to start and it turned into something really big. I'm sure they could clarify it a lot better but sure. um they actually sponsor uh us on bitcoin kindergarten me and optimus's show so oh cool i've gotten pretty close with hodl not we talk a good amount um yeah hodl not and caddy are really cool people highly recommend citadel 21 got it so let's jump back to this list um don't sit around and wait for things to happen go make them happen i think this is just what you're living this is how you live your life um you know you you you're on your Bitcoin journey and you dropped out of school, you know, and you lost your job and now you're making a career in your way in Bitcoin. Um, networking and valuable skills is greater than a college degree. So how, how would you explain that to people your age? So to people my age, I would say, would you rather network? Like if you're trying to build a business, if you're trying to get a nice job, if you're trying to do anything productive, in your professional life college probably isn't the best place for you to uh, network just because you're surrounded by a a bunch of other kids who most don't even know why they're at in college you know um, i'm not saying you can't go to college and network with people and you know be successful you know the ceo and the cto of bitcoin magazine both went to college together you know forum uh not forum bitcoin magazine but they bought bitcoin magazine and now they're good friends and you know they're very successful but socializing and networking on twitter has led to me networking with them in real life i went to bitblock boom in dallas uh the very beginning of september you know late august and it's so cool to walk around and just meet with some of the top people in the space and everyone is so nice they're so welcoming Everyone treated me like family. Like, like for example, like Justin Moon is a top Bitcoin developer, and I just walked up to him and started talking to him. And he's like, "Dude, I love your account. You know, I I I love seeing your tweets. Blah blah blah." Like, it's I, I'm talking with American Hoddle. You know, all these other rich millionaires. I'm talking with people who want to, you know, have me on podcasts. Who want to do work with me? You know, this, that, and the other. And it's like. There is no other place that I can think of where some 19, 20 year old kid can talk with these people who are doing so well in life, be friends with them and, you know, make business deals with them. Like, I just think there is much more opportunity, 
you know, meeting these people than meeting a bunch of college kids. Like I remember uh, hearing like you are who you hang out with. So it's like, okay, so I got to be friends and network with as many rich and successful people as possible. Well, yeah, that's a good point. That's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, the next one, actions speak louder than words. Um, I, I mean, again, I think this is just kind of how you're, you're going about things. This one, I think, is is just so important. Money rules just about every aspect of life. And and I'm not sure, I, I think that would blow me away as, you know, as, as a younger person, um, just kind of thinking how, through the lens of Bitcoin, how I see how money plays into so many things. How would you go about talking about that with your friends or, or people your age? So I'd say you want the best money. You really want to research how to make money, how to keep money, and how to make multiple streams of income. You know, a lot of people, I've, I know some people personally who have inherited money my age from, let's say, grandparents dying away, I mean, passing away, etc., and they've blown hundreds of thousands of dollars on stupid stuff. You know, I know people who take out ridiculous debt. Like one of my buddies from high school took out a 30K car loan his junior year of high school. And then after senior year, he took out, I don't even know how many in loans to go to school. And it's just he's enjoying it now, but I just feel bad for him when he has to face reality and pay it all off. And it just rules your life. You know, debt and money, like fiat money is modern day slavery today. And, you know, you can read all about that. And uh, Robert Breedlove has a fantastic article on that called masters and slaves of money. And it, the U S dollar is very political um, I was amazed to find out that the quality of money can affect the quality of food we eat, the quality of clothes we have, and so much more. It, you really want to start building wealth to live a good life, and you want to live this low time preference life. I think a lot of kids my age live a high time preference life, and it's starting to, like, I know a ton of kids who say stuff like, oh, like, it's so hard to get rich. I'll never be rich. Like, I'm just going to spend all my money now because I'm young and I got to enjoy it while I can before I'm old and I got to start taking life seriously and stuff. And I think that so many people like that get behind in life and there's so many benefits and advantages to uh, saving and investing early at a young age. But I feel like humanity has to progress. I feel like we've made so many technological advances, but we are being held back by, you know, 19th century money. Fiat money is just outdated. It's bad. It's, it's not productive. It doesn't benefit society, in my opinion. I think we need a hard money like Bitcoin and absolute scarce money like Bitcoin to really kick humanity in the butt and say, you got to start progressing in life. You know, you got to start moving forward. You know, there people say, oh, we should be on Mars by now. We should have cured cancer by now. We should have done this. We should have done that. And I agree to some extent, like we have so much technology today, like humanity, I feel like should be in such a better place, but it's hard for people to do good things in life when they're constantly having their wealth stolen from them via inflation and ridiculous tax rates. I, I agree. I, I think the, you know, the other two points you make in the article, you know, really apply to any age as well. Ignore the haters and uh, do what makes you happy. Uh, and again, you're just really living that out. And I, I think that's great to see. Uh, I want to talk about your other article, the U S founding fathers would have been Bitcoin maximalists. Um, what, 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 what made you draw that conclusion? So I think the founding fathers are brilliant. I think they had elite vision of, you know, small government, give power to the people. I really, I really agree with a lot they have to say, but one of the things was 
uh, shout out to Doctor Bitcoin MD on Twitter. He he would always tweet stuff about the founding fathers and like quotes and stuff, and that's what really got me to kind of research more into it and see what they would have to say. And the more I read into it, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, like you know, Bitcoin is freedom. What would the founding fathers have to say about it? The more I researched, the more I was like, oh my gosh, the founding fathers would have loved Bitcoin. And I decided uh, that would just be a fun article to write. And I think a lot of people would like it. So one night after I was done doing all my homework and stuff, I just knocked it all out and published it. What What do you think the founding fathers would think of the year 2020 and what's going on in the U.S.? I think they would be extremely disappointed. I think they would like people are giving up their privacy and their freedom for security and letting government inch by inch take more and more power. I think they would be going around calling everyone pussies and stuff. And like, I just think they would be super pissed and I agree with them. And it's like, I think people are so scared for no reason. I think people just lack personal responsibility. I just there's a lot wrong in society today, and I think the founding fathers would not be happy. Right. Um, what do you think of 2020, and how are you dealing with things? And, and what do you see for you know your peers? Like, uh, are they taking this seriously? Uh, how has it impacted your friends' lives, and and how you're interacting with maybe you know your friends and family, your parents, your grandparents? So my friends, they it's kind of hard for them because they don't really pay attention to this stuff. Like a lot of them just carry on doing whatever they're doing. And like, I know a lot of them watch the debate between Biden and Trump, but other than that, I don't, you know, I know some of my friends, unfortunately are big advocates for socialism. Like they, it's not because they've researched socialism and they like it. It's just, I think, I think it's because everyone else is so like oh fuck trump i love socialism like you know let's do that i think they're just kind of persuaded by everyone else and are like oh well i like socialism so i only like socialism because everyone else does but um my family like my parents they keep up to date they know all the stuff that's going on they're not red pilled yet i've really been trying but like my dad is so reluctant he's like I think my dad's like, oh, Nick's going, you know, through that college phase where he thinks he knows everything. And like he's, you know, he's quote unquote woke. And so when he's older, he'll be like me and he'll think like me. But I strongly disagree with that. Like I remember (laughs) I remember asking my dad what quantitative easing was. And he just looked at me like, I don't even know what that word means. Like, (laughs) he's like, I've never heard that word before. Right. But uh yeah, I've I've actually not talked to my grandparents about it. Um, I actually I'm from Virginia, but I moved out of Virginia about a, a little over a month ago to Tennessee. So, huh? I've been here. I, I was gonna get to that because um, I I think I you know you you spoke a lot about your decision coming out of high school. I think your parents were you know vacations a lot at a lake house and always dreamed about building a house there and then kind of let you know that they were going to build a house there and you had to choose whether you were going to go away to college or move to the lake house or stay in your hometown mm-hmm. uh and and it was interesting because you you were i guess obviously you were at the time were adamant about staying in your hometown and figuring out how to make that work for me you know college whether it was a good bet or not and i think it was a great bet for me at the time but uh, even if it wasn't a great financial bet, uh, I was excited to get out of my town and, and meet new people and expand my horizons f- from that perspective because a lot of the people I grew up with didn't have similar views and, and didn't want to go on, on these, you know, down the rabbit holes that I was, I was going into. And I wanted to meet more what I thought would be more interesting people. So I'm, I'm really kind of curious. Like, so you, you, and you, it seemed like you stayed there for a while and then you just moved. So what, what happened there? So... For the about a year and a half, two years out of high school, I stayed in my hometown and my parents moved to the lake house. We sold our house um, in my hometown and for a little bit, I lived with my grandparents 
that did not last long for <laughs> I think obvious reasons. But um, eventually my friend hit me up and he was like, bro, like, and this is like a really good, really good friend. His parents super chill. They're like, dude, come live with us. Like, you don't have to pay rent or anything. I still did just because I didn't want to like, you know, I feel like I was taking advantage of them. So I just paid rent anyways. But um, I lived at my friend's house for the rest of the time I was there. But I was not ready to move away. I lived such a good life in my hometown that it took me a while to adjust to, you know, being out of high school, being away from all my friends uh, from high school, etc. And as well as I lived about an hour away from D.C. And there was a lot of money in my area. There was a lot of opportunity to network and get a job. And I didn't want to – I felt like I was passing up an opportunity because the school I was going to go to was in a small town and – I was just, I don't know. I was just, I, I didn't feel like it was the right move for me. And I didn't want to put myself in that position where if I would have gone and I didn't like it, that I would have really hated it. So I decided to just stay where I was. But when coronavirus hit, I left the city where I was living and went to my parents' lake house, which was more in the country. Cause the day that Virginia got put on a mandatory lockdown, me and my friends went up to the high school to play soccer and there was a cop like, you know, getting all pissed off at us because we weren't wearing masks and social distancing. And he was like, you all got to go home right now, blah, blah, blah. Like you can't be here. You know, there's way too many of you here. And that really annoyed me. So I was like, I'm going to my parents' house in the country for a bit where no cops going to harass me and I can go outside when, you know, wherever I want. And I stayed there for a bit. <laughs> a lot longer than I planned and I eventually stayed there until after I got home from Bitblock Boom. So the week I got home from Bitblock Boom, I literally just packed up my car and drove down to Tennessee and um, I've been in Tennessee ever since. How's it going? Do you dig it? Yeah, I like it. Um, I'm probably going to end up getting, I'm staying at an Airbnb right now, but I'm going to get my own apartment here pretty soon. So I'm pretty stoked for that. That's great. That sounds awesome. Um, Where do you see Bitcoin in five or 10 years? You know, that's a really difficult question because so much can change in five to 10 years. So much. I mean, you look at Bitcoin now and like one month goes by. And it's like one month in Bitcoin time is like a couple months in like normal time. You know what I mean? Right. Like so much happens. And um, I like to try and stay a little conservative with my views. Like obviously I want to be a huge Bitcoin bull like everyone else. Like say, oh, we're going to be in the millions by this date or, you know, tens of millions by this date. But I don't know. One of the things I really hope is when I'm older, let's say five, anywhere between five and 10 years from now, I just want Bitcoin to, I, I would be happy spending it at a few certain places. Like, let's say maybe I can buy a house or a car with Bitcoin, like some, some stuff I actually need. I don't care about using Bitcoin to pay for my groceries. Like I think, I mean, that would be dope, like living in a world like that. But for right now, I'm just so focused on spending dirty fiat and accumulating sats. But, man, that's a hard question. You know, Bitcoin, it solved the money problem for me. Uh, Bitcoin Tino always talks about how money ought to be the riskless asset and how people park their value in other assets because the US dollar and fiat currencies are just such a bad place to store your wealth. You know, if you were to put, if you were to give someone a million dollars and say, you can't touch this million for five or 10 years, what would you store it in? Would you store it in fiat, real estate, stocks, or gold? And no one says fiat, you know? And I just think Bitcoin solves that money problem. And Honestly, anything that advances Bitcoin, I'm looking forward to. 
Uh, I know a lot of people think that, oh, in five to 10 years, Bitcoin will already be the world reserve currency. I don't think that, at least not right now. I think that the United States government can kick the can down the road a lot longer, at least maybe 20 years. Um, How would they do it? I don't know. That's just a guess I'm taking. Right. But um, I think Bitcoin is poised to grow exponentially. And I don't mean just by price. I mean, you know, users, uh, infrastructure, adoption, et cetera. I think the future is incredibly bright for Bitcoin. Uh, at what price do your parents come around and, and think you're a genius? <laughs> Dude, I don't even know. Like, I probably, I'm guessing 100K. Right. I don't think they'll take me seriously until 100K. Yeah, I always joke around. Uh, at 10K, they'll talk to me again over there. But at, at 20K, they'll think I'm a genius. Um, are you ever going to go back to school again? I promised my parents I would. Um, I... I have five years for my transcripts. Like my transcripts are so good for the next five years. So I can go back anytime within the next five years and complete my classes. I only, I only have four more uh, classes to take for my associate's degree. So it's like, I'm nearly finished with that, but I'll probably end up finishing that. It just kind of depends where life takes me. Like let's say in a couple years, if for some reason I'm not working a job or like, cause I, I work a ton of hours for Bitcoin magazine right now. I don't have time to go to school, but uh, let's say like, let's say if Bitcoin kindergarten were to take off and me and Optimus start, uh, let's say we make a product or a service or something and we start generating income and that's like my main source of income. I, I feel like I could do Bitcoin kindergarten and finish my education at the same time. But it's just, I think school is incredibly overpriced. I think, like, the whole thing about uh, universities having their student loan debt be uh, guaranteed by the government so they can then, you know, loan out any amount of money they want to their students because they know for a fact once the students sign off on that debt, they have to pay it. So they can charge these ridiculous prices. And I just think, I don't think I will go to a you know state university or public university until the prices get cheaper, especially because if I were to go to school right now, there's no, I, I wouldn't know what I want to do. What, what do you want to be doing in 10 years? In 10 years, um, so in 10 years, I want to be married. I want to start having kids by the time I'm 30. I want to spend my 20s building wealth. And then in my 30s, I can not slow down, but I can start like focusing more on raising a family. I want to start a business or something. I eventually want to be my own boss because I don't want to like, I like working for other people. Like, it's fine, but I feel like I can only take so much of it until, you know, like, I want to be, you know, the top dog. I want to be pulling the strings at whatever company I'm working at. I want to run things my way. And the only way to do that is to run my own business or, you know, something like that. So definitely on my bucket list, start my own business. And I mean, I kind of already have with Optimus, you know, we started Bitcoin Kindergarten and you know, we're not slowing down on that anytime soon. And we have some stuff we have uh, in the in the works for that. But um, we've just both been a little busy with work. So we're eventually going to get around to it. But yeah, uh, I would love to do Bitcoin kindergarten full time and somehow create income from that. That'd be dope. Yeah, uh, that sounds awesome. You just got to meet, meet Mrs. Bitcoin. Miss Bitcoin Zoomer. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then, then it all comes together. I mean, you really have a great outlook on things. Um, you know, one thing I've kind of learned or seen a lot is, you know, if you spend your twenties partying and having a good time, you're going to spend your thirties and forties trying to scramble and catch up. If you spend your twenties creating value, like you said, and, and, and building a business or 
some sort of revenue stream, you're going to really have a good time in your 30s and 40s. Uh, mm-hmm. It's going to be a ball. And, and I think that a lot of people want, you know, to have a good time right away. Um, it's amazing to me, you know, like with the college situation or the proposition, I should say, you know, it, you know, you give a, a, a 17, 18 year old kid 200 grand to go to college or 100 grand uh, low interest and uh, guaranteed loan by the, the government. And it's, what's weird about that is you would never there are so few people. I can't think of any bank that would give that kid a two hundred thousand dollar loan to start a car wash. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet they give out the money for for the schools very easily, which distorts that market, but it distorts the incentives because uh, everyone's telling, you know, and I was told the same thing. If you, if I don't go to college, I'm not going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very predatory. Yeah. When I turned eighteen, I was getting emails, phone calls, and physical mail from my bank. By the way, fuck Wells Fargo. Um, <laughs> I was getting so much mail from them, like pretty like I would always read it as, Hey idiot, you're going to college next year. Take out this loan with us. And then oh, I also see you're graduating high school. Why don't you celebrate by taking a vacation? Right. You can't afford it? Well, we you can take out a loan with us. You know, go to the Bahamas this summer. You know, have a good time. Spend all the money you want. It's like it starts there. I remember, yeah, when I went to college, uh, the first day of school, you know, in the student union, there was a credit card company at every table. And they'd give you a free plastic cup with the school name on it and whatever you want to sign up for a credit card. And I thought it was bizarre then. And and it's still it's still going on. I, I took out a home equity loan on my house, not not to be used, just I took, out a, took it out a while ago because why not? You know, they were offering me the, the the line of credit and I figured great to have it if I ever need it. And if I don't use it, fine. When we were at the meeting with the banker, um, you know, she's like, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to use the money for? And I said, nothing. Uh, I'm not going to use it. And my wife was like, well, what can we use the money for? And she was like, well, you could go on a vacation. You could uh, build out your house. You could buy a car you can't afford. She's like, and if you need more money, just let us know. We'll loan you as much as you want to get in over your head. Um, mm-hmm. They try and trap you right yeah, from the start. Yeah, uh, but but the weird thing is, if you you know, it's it's if you need money, it's really hard to get it. If you need a loan, um, mm-hmm. it's, you really need to go before you need it. Um, in, in that regard, but yeah, it's very predatory. And I, one of the things I just want to say real quick is, I don't think all debt is bad. Like, I think you can use debt to your advantage. Like, for example, when we were at early 10K last month, and I know people are going to give me shit for this and call me stupid, but I think it's genius. I took out a credit card that has zero interest for 18 months, and I put 30% of that and bought Bitcoin with it. And I'm just, you know, I'm just doing the monthly payments on it until it starts charging interest, and then I'll just pay it all off. So... I mean, I just, it's like a speculative attack on the US dollar. You know, I'm using debt mm-hmm. against them to accumulate more Bitcoin. And now we're at 11.4K. Like, I have more sats now yeah. than I would have if I didn't. So I'm happy with that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a baller Chad move. Uh, I'm not really <laughs> recommending everybody go out and do that. Uh, that's, that's on Nick. And Nick has a lot of time to make up these kinds of these bets. Uh, but yeah, man, that that is the way to. I, I think that is the way to think about it, and I think a lot of people are moving to that that kind of way of thinking. So, I that's awesome. This has been great, man. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you taking the time out to speak with us. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate you having me on, dude. Like this is awesome. I love just sitting down and shooting the shit with some bitcoiners. Like, I. I'll come on anytime you want, dude. This is awesome. That's great, man. That's why we're doing the show. Uh, I really hope, you know, people listen to this kind of show because I think, you know, Bitcoiners have, you know, they, they have a lot to say and I think we can learn a lot from each other, especially some of the leaders in the field like yourself. Um, and I think that, you know, coming from it where you are at such a young age, and I hate to bring up the age because it's so ridiculous and I don't think age belongs in Bitcoin, but it's remarkable, Um you know, the, the insight and the vision you have and, and the grinding you're doing to get ahead. Um, Thank it's, it's kind of what I'm trying to give my kids, um, and, and still for them. And I, I hope they pick it up. Uh, I hope I don't make it too easy for them. 
Thank you. Where, where can people find you? People can find me on Twitter at Nick Can't Mine. Um, I don't really have any other socials. Yeah, just on Twitter at Nick Can't Mine. That's uh, yeah, and check out Bitcoin Magazine. Um, check out Bitcoin Kindergarten at BTC Kindergarten on Twitter. Where where are where are the people hanging out these days besides Twitter? Where where your friends go? Are they on Snapchat? Where, where are they? Where where can we find young no coiners? Definitely Snapchat. Like I've brought up to Bitcoin Magazine multiple times that we need to start pushing ads on Snapchat. Like when I'm scrolling through my friends' stories on Snapchat, um, I always see Coinbase ads, and as much as I hate Coinbase, like they're doing good marketing there. Um, everyone used to be on Instagram, but I think over the past year or two, we've seen a slow drain from Instagram. I ended up deleting mine not too long ago. I, I just couldn't take it. I just thought it was kind of stupid. I really only used it to keep up with girls I went to school with, but, right. um, Yes, so mainly just Snapchat. Not many people use Facebook. Uh, Twitter's a big one. But it's hard for me to follow some of the kids I went to high school with on Twitter just because, I don't know, they just post really cringe stuff. Or they don't post anything. They just retweet, like, you know, normal stuff. And I I just like Bitcoin a lot better. Yeah, I I don't think Twitter's good for real life. And that's kind of why I got off Facebook, and I'm only on Twitter, and I, I don't really interact with my my real life friends on Twitter. Um, I, I just like the battle of ideas on Twitter, oh, yeah. and my yeah, I don't think my real life network is is you know, I mean, they're just going about their day and posting you know baby pictures, and that's great, it's fine, uh, but it's not really where I'm spending my time, or and 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 I don't want to see that on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the age thing, I was uh, that's why I was anonymous for a little bit. Is because, or I, I kind of am not anonymous, but uh, I have a swindom. I know some people know some of my personal information, but not everyone. Right. But I kept my age off for a little bit because the way I see it is ideas matter, not individuals. Like if a lot of people would look at the stuff I was posting, they would probably think I was a lot older. They would. And I feel like if they saw what I was posting and they were like, oh, this kid's 18, 19, 20, like, who is, like, this kid's a LARPer. Like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just, you know, he's younger than me. So that means he doesn't know what he's talking about. So it took me a while to actually, like, say my age. And I was very happy that most people still took me seriously. I still have had some people say, oh, well, you're just a stupid college kid. You don't know what you're doing. Like, I just brush them off and ignore the haters. That's, that was one of the steps in uh, my Citadel 21 article. I, I think the your age kind of gives you more credibility, in my opinion. And I think it actually... But when you include your age in your articles, it almost limits them because I, I, I don't think they just apply to people your age. And so it's you know it, it's it's a sword that cuts both ways because the articles are, are kind of written from a certain lens and, and hopefully helping people in that age group, I guess. But... I'm like, everyone needs to hear this. I still have friends and peers that act like kids and, and don't mm-hmm. get these themes. Um, I, I wish a lot of kids, like seniors in high school, juniors in high school, would read my stuff so they can make, like, you know, maybe not fall into the trap of taking out 100K loans for school and, you know, maybe start accumulating some Bitcoin, even if it's just a little bit. Like, just something little that can make like a massive impact on their life. Like that's what I had in I uh in my mind for uh, some of my articles. Yeah, and I, I, I that came across and and that's why I wanted to have you on the show cuz I think they're impactful. I think everyone should go check them out. Um I really appreciate it. This has been awesome. Mhm. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, man. Peace. Peace. That was Nick Can't Mind, the Bitcoin Zoomer shooting down bullshit excuses and encouraging people of all ages to own their outcomes right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dug the show, please vote with your thumbs and press those five stars. That's the best way to spread the word. This is said. Peace out.